Tuesday, June 22nd, 2021, Reno County Commission to order this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag and a prayer by Pastor Camberry, Minister. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. With liberty and justice for all. Let us pray. God of all seasons, in one day the temperature dipped 20 degrees, proving that life is full of ups and downs. We know that in the jerky times of life and the changes, you are there. Thank you for being a constant presence and for guiding us. Today, Lord, Lead this meeting so that our county thrives and grows more abundantly. Give wisdom to our leaders and lead our discussion and decisions. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Welcome, everyone, to the meeting. I appreciate very much the fact that we have pastors who will take some of their time to come in and, and get us started in this meeting. Our uh, next on the item is the public comment. Our item's not on the agenda. I don't see anyone here today. So are there any additions or revisions to the agenda? Also, I want to welcome Commissioner Sellers via Zoom today. Commissioner Friesen, do you have any additions or revisions? No, no, no. Commissioner Sellers, any additions? No. no. Uh, administrator? No. Joe? No, sir. All right. The consent agenda consists of the following. Vouchers totaling $1,268,090.07. The minutes for the meeting June 8, 2021. Solid waste purchase of a 2021 CAT motor grader from Foley Equipment for $265,532.59. The appointment of Craig Smith as clerk on the Lincoln Township Board. And a renewed application for cereal malt beverage license for O'Brien's Marina LLC for on premises sales. And also renew application for the cereal malt beverage license for O'Brien's Marina for off premises sales. Uh, is there any uh, commissioner who wants to discuss any further items? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to discuss item 6C. Um, is that okay? 6C? Yep. Okay. We uh, approve the consent agenda A, B, D, E, F. And uh, let's take a motion to approve those items. So moved. Okay, it's been moved. It's moved and seconded to approve the following items. Items A, B, D, E, and F from the uh, consent agenda. So uh, at this time, uh, Commissioner, let's take up the solid wood. The purchase of the 2021 cat motor grinder. Um, is this a, are we discussing the motion or, or we, we didn't vote on that? We did not vote on that, so you wanted to take it off and, and, uh, and uh, further discussion or explanations? There's a motion to approve the others, as I understood it. Yes, the motion is to approve the bill on that and then discuss it. Sorry about that. I'm in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> or I'm sleepy, one or the other. Roll call, please. Commissioner Friesen? Yes. Mr. Sellers? Yes. Mr. Hurst? Yes. Okay, now we can get me back on the right order. So we'll discuss the uh, uh, purchase of the cat motor grader. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Randy, I apologize for not bringing this up ahead of the meeting. It's my fault for. Okay. Um, the uh, I just had a couple questions, and if if we need, I know Megan's not here, so that's not really fair either. But 
The um, do you know how often we we turn over these vehicles? I know it said after ten thousand hours, but do you know what the the years? Year? Are? I'm not sure on that. The number of years. No, I I would need to check with Megan on that. Okay. Is this something that um, they're needing to get right away? I think for the price, pro or I just said it takes time, but I mean, is it our CIP? Meaning in the next couple weeks, like if it was table till next meeting next week, yeah. probably wouldn't have heard anything. Um, I'm, I'm mainly interested in whether these turnover, you know, in a in a typical lease period of five years or whether they turn over more less frequently, like every 10 years or so. We're going to find out how often they, or when they hit the 10,000 hours, kind of how often that takes place. And then along with that, do we have um, any information related to kind of the last half of the life of the, the machines on how much it looks like here that there's a three hour, 5,000, I'm sorry, a three year, 5,000 hour warranty included and in what what our co typical costs are for this piece of equipment um, on the last half, so the last 5,000 hours. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. you say that again? So right now, um, it, let me give you a little context of the, my thought process here is, you know, there's kind of a, a, a sweet spot on when you turn a vehicle or a large piece of machine or machinery like this back in. And if you hold, hold on to it too long, it can eat your lunch and, and maintenance costs. And so... Sometimes leasing these vehicles and keeping them newer um, can make some sense in certain instances. And so I was just either A, wanting to know whether we had analyzed that as an option, or B, um, back to the question. So this new piece of equipment has a warranty for 5,000 hours or three years, but we keep it for 10,000. So what's the... If we just use this as an example, maybe we could get the amount of um, repair costs that we put into that vehicle that we're replacing, or this piece of machinery that we're replacing over the last year. In other words, cost of operation per hour after 5,000 hours? Yeah, or just total cost of operation. I'm sure I can get that in Megan. I can have Megan come up if you want to table this until later, have her come into the meeting. She's not available next Tuesday. This the replacement um, machine is a 2011 model. 2011. That's years ago. Okay. That's ten years. So. Uh, this is 2021 here. On. That's the, uh, the the one being replaced. Okay. Is a 2011. Not the re okay. not the new one. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's. So we bought it new 10 years ago. Yeah. They're on a pretty good schedule here, so to, she won't I'll, be here next week. I'll, she uh, will be available next what, week. What she can come in today, though. She can come in later. She can today. come in if you table it. Yes. For Whatever later. it takes to get in town. Okay. okay. You want to let me know this? Yeah. Next week? Is it something? Like, are they down a unit, like they need to get it, or is this just replacing a, a unit that's in operation? When it's a unit in operation, I can double check, but that's... Why, why, don't, why don't I just do this? I can talk to you and Megan before next meeting, and we just put it on the next next meeting agenda. Or she doesn't need to be here. Yeah. Then, then we can give her a little time. Is that okay? Yeah, as long as we have that information. That okay with you, Commissioner Sellers, as long as we all have that information. Yes, I do agree with it, but I, I think they are. I, I asked Mark to have it. The waste department slip. Because they are for this machine. I think they will be But the one thing that the Commissioner Fraser made that I, I think that for large purchases like this, they possibly 
sheriff and uh, patrol captain. Hope they were not going to recommend it. I don't know that they had any relation. So, Randall, are you saying that we're getting budgetary savings through this program? the sheriff wants to use those savings for additional vehicles. I think he does have additional vehicles. One, uh, the jail vehicle hasn't been replaced in a while, and then I believe as we've moved some, as the sheriff moved staff from the jail to patrol, that's probably going to increase the number of vehicles. He probably will. We are saving back one vehicle that we would have traded for the new patrol addition. 436. Uh, the jail vehicle, they're wanting to replace.
that when it says total hours, is that engine hours? Total hours is total engine hours. And idle hours is when it's idle. Because these hybrids just shut themselves off and start setting the scene. So, essentially, like again, looking at the bottom one on each grouping, what you're saying here is that even though you drove the same amount of miles, about 75% of the time it was using electric power, not engine power. Correct. That should save a lot of engine life. Oh, yeah, I think so too. We've had tremendous luck with these hybrids so far. And their performance, they did take one or two of these to a driving school in Oklahoma. Well, I don't know if you guys got the opportunity to ride in one of the hybrids out of the driver training. Oh, it was a hybrid or not. Yeah, I, I rode in a non-hybrid as well. Okay. But their performance is pretty outstanding. Well, this looks like a, a good program. You've really had good luck with transferring some of these older sheriff's vehicles into, uh, into other departments. Uh, right now, the appraisers department, five of their seven vehicles are old sheriff's units. And they're probably the most in need of some capital replacements. They were get one of these SUVs after the first of the year, but they had one vehicle on their replacement plan, which I would like. And we can get more into this in the budget discussion. One other question. Is it, is it usually the engine that goes first? Is, is that the reason why the lifespan is we, we really have not had any engine problems with these uh, SUVs as long as we've done it. We started in 2013, I believe. Well, what, what causes the need to replace then? If we said, okay, in five years we think we're going to need to replace, if it's not the engine, what is it? Well, other issues. In the early SUVs, we had a lot of problems with the, what they call PTUs, transfer case. Pretty much solved that issue. The 2020 Explorers have a standard like truck transfer case. Uh, for so long, it's just a matter of starting to replace and replace and replace. Yes. Okay. Thank you. As you can see from my chart, the fuel expenses were way down in 2020 due to COVID. Uh, I expect that price to be going up closer to the 2018 figures. We're seeing an increase in, based on 260. So a slight increase in fuel prices now. Well, I figured 260 would be our price because that takes out the 18.4 cents for the federal tax. Okay. I do if you're interested, I do have a yearly report on fuel and maintenance costs on each vehicle. I can certainly email them if you're ever in need of any of that information. Okay, thank you. Make a motion to approve the automotive update. So moved. That, uh, that doesn't include. Does it include a five-year rotation then, or is that in a different area? Uh, I don't know that you need to approve the report. It's just a report, but if, yeah, if you wanted a motion to direct Kyle and myself to start having the five-year cycle for the hybrids, that would be a different motion or directive. Well, thank you, Kyle, for the paper. Does the commission uh, want to uh, work, suggest that Randy and Kyle and the sheriff work on them, come back with a report regarding a five-year rotation? Yes. Okay. Care of that now. The, the discussion regarding expansion to a five member board of commission for Reno County. Any comments? 
Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, say that I had uh, unsolicited comments from uh, two people, uh, former City uh, Commissioner Dean Brigman and uh, uh, a gentleman from South Hutchinson that's been with South Hutchinson City for many years, James Dole, both uh, suggesting that they favored the discussion that we're having moving towards five commissioners. I received an email from Dean Brinkman also. Uh, Commissioner Friesen, you received one too? Same one. Okay. Uh, my question is, considering our time frame, uh, and, and I'm not saying for or against, but what I have a problem I have a suggestion we look at and how much difference does it make if the people don't have any idea uh, what district they're going to be in, what it affects, what's, what's the price tag. Uh, in other words, I, my feeling is that if we don't give time inform the public I'm not sure what really chance it might have and maybe I'm uh, I'm, I'm hearing uh, not so much for or against just the fact that we don't have a clue what it would do I think there's pluses and minuses but that's just what I'm hearing and I just want to bring that, that point out there hasn't been a groundswell from the public for this, and so if we're going to consider this, we'll need to go out and we'll need to inform the public enough time for them to uh, discover the, uh, uh, the pluses. Well, I, I agree, Commissioner Hurst, uh, of your comments, but if uh, if we move on our time schedule, uh, either vote up or down on this by the 1st of August, that gives us uh, at least uh, three more meetings to discuss and plan, and maybe more than that. Uh, I, I would think that August, September, October would be plenty of time to uh, tell, tell the public that's interested in this matter uh, uh, why the majority of the uh, commission uh, feels that it's in the best interest of the uh, of the county. Uh, I fully believe that it, it might pass, it might not pass, but I think it's the commission's duty to propose to the public what we feel is best. Then it's the public's duty to decide for themselves which way they think that they, they want to vote. And I, I certainly understand the power of the vote, but for us to just push this down the road when at least myself and I think uh, uh, some others uh, uh, believe that we would be better serving the county and better serving their county administrator by having a broader cross-section of representatives from the county, uh, I, I don't see any reason to put it off. It's not going to take that time much. People aren't going to study this for hours after hours and read uh, minutes from uh, years and years back. They're going to make a decision on uh, uh, what they believe is, is best for the community, and uh, I respect that decision that they'll make. But I think it's my job as a commissioner to propose what I feel is best interest of the county for future years. And in my opinion, uh, uh, it's in the best interest of the community to broaden our commission uh, from three to five. And uh, uh, we have time to do it. We have time to inform the public. And then we'll just let them decide whether we say yay or nay. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem with what you're saying. Is we will have to decide upon where the districts are before we can look at, uh, at providing that information. So that's part of that process, isn't that correct? 
Well, that's a good question. Is the um, map before or after the vote? If the county commission initiates the process, you have to redistrict the, uh, you have to decide on the districts and, and, and the geographical limitations, the, the content population content of the district. So that's the resolution that you pass is uh, dividing the county into five districts and um, then that's what that's what's submitted to the voters. If if the process is initiated by petition from the public, then just the general question is put forward on a ballot and if it passes, then the county commission within thirty days after it passes would be required to uh, divide the county into the five districts. But you're talking about initiating a process, so that would mean that certainly by, by the 1st of August, you would need to adopt a, a new resolution dividing the county into five commissioner districts. And what date would that be? Well, the Donna Patton has indicated that she would like that to be done, or, or Jenna, by, by early August. Do you want to address that? I mean, the, the statute says 60 days in advance of a general election, but I think you're telling me you need additional time. Would you address that? <laughs> and August 10th is the first commission meeting in August. Um, if, if the Jenna Baird deputy election officer, um, if you did have it, the ballot language to me by August 10th, we could put it on the ballot. Um, so, like, if you were to pass it August 10th, we could we could still do that uh, because when we do the programming, we'll know that it's coming, so we'll be able to allot for that. So, if, if we did need to go to August 10th and pass it then, then that would probably be the furthest that we could extend it. Do you need is it is it a full legal description of every boundary that you would require? The and we can get you a copy of the existing orders because we do that every year. It's, it's based upon the most recent census and the most recent census available to us is 2010. The 2020 won't be available until September sometime. So a vote of this nature would be based upon a 2010 census and the resolution uh, divides the county into districts defined by townships, precincts and wards and those are assigned to each district and then from that you can see a map so it's not necessarily geographical boundaries but it's it's voting voting precincts. voting precincts isn't that what we're talking about voting precincts are we are we putting together voting precincts is that what we're doing are we creating new you're not creating any new ones, you're using existing ones. And if, yes. uh, if you did try to split a precinct, it would create separate precinct boxes <coughs> within that precinct. I don't think you can split a precinct. What what we're discussing that? Um, we, we did discuss that, yeah. Did we um, resolve that? I don't believe we did. <laughs> I, I don't think you can split the precincts, at least uh, maybe you and I disagree on that, but that's an issue we'd have to resolve. So these precincts are defined by geographic but who defines them? I don't know. I mean, I think we have. Donna, you've been here long enough. I know we've redefined precincts and combined them and, and so forth. And um, doesn't happen very often. It's just been that way. I don't, I don't know how they first created it. No. So, so, for instance, I remember one time I was in the tent where I lived. Now, I think I'm in the fourth. That had to happen by some methodology. So, maybe we can go back and determine that report on that. <laughs> Randy, the uh, maps that we've been provided to just study to uh, have an indication of where we might be moving to for the proposed five districts, those aren't suggesting splitting precincts, are they? Correct. Those are based on the current precincts. I I think I'm very uh, opposed to coming up with anything that would create different precincts or split precincts. I think there's just enough opportunity to uh, make the five districts 
all but equal without even thinking about that direction. Well, Joe, with the resolution, then just list the districts. So district one has this list of precincts. And district two has these precincts. Is that yes. versus an actual description of the precincts? I'll just list what the precincts are. The first part of your question is correct. Okay. Yes. County Clerk, I think another thing we have to be aware of too is this is redistricting year. So the state um, will have to redistrict their lines and that may be part of what happened the last time. They'll, they could possibly move their uh, their boundaries with um, our state representatives too. So that may have been what happened to yours, Joe. And when would they do that? They'll do that. Uh, they'll have, well, they'll get the figures in September. So they'll start working on it right after that. And the last time this happened, they never, they couldn't decide on anything, so the court stepped in and did it for them. So that could possibly pay, play a role in all this too, but that's something that we would have to address after the first of the year. And that would be the, the fact if they do that, then that could change the population in our district. So we would look at that like we do every year right, after, after January 1st. Correct. Where that would be change. required. Or, yeah. You'd be, if this, Either way, whether this passes or not, you'd be required at the organization of the next county commission uh, in uh, January uh, to look at redistricting based upon the 2020 census, which would be available at that time. But but in going forward, I, I, I would not think that there would be any big changes between what you would decide if you decide in, in August from then until January. There might be a few, but... But at least then, in, in January of 2022, you would have current census information, and you'd be required to use that. And then, uh, what did we determine as far as incumbents? <coughs> I'm sorry. What happens to incumbents? They're full term commissioners. And uh, what about incumbents? Well, you've split the district, so we're. We're now we're in the district, according to Commissioner Green. I think the way I read that is if you're our present commissioner and you are located in whatever district you're located in, your home is, that's where you would be, correct? Wherever your residence is, whatever district that remains or becomes is where you would be. And then if there are, if, if the, if the voters approve the uh, districting, then the governor is required within 30 days to appoint uh, persons to fill the, uh, new, the new districts. And they would hold their office until um, the, for one year until the next general election, at which time it would be uh, an election on, on those two districts plus Commissioner Selmer's district, which would be up that year. It would not affect the time in office of uh, Commissioner Hurst or Commissioner Friesen because they were elected for four years and are in the first year of that four-year term, correct? That's correct. The main thing we will, the person wants to not do is to have four new commissioners at once. Well, the statute provides uh, for that so that that doesn't happen. I think Commissioner Hurst brings up a good point that we maybe the next step here is to determine the total cost associated with this action and then the ongoing costs associated with an additional two commission members. And just pro rough, it would be, I think, $36,000 in salaries and the benefit cost, so maybe $50,000 and we add the taxes paid for salaries and then. Another couple of desks, you know, maybe a little bit more office supplies, but there really isn't that much cost per commissioner. Is there significant costs associated with the election itself? Because it'll be on the general ballot, so that's why it's just added to it. Is it possible, uh, Randy, we could come up with? 
have a fact sheet that we could, uh, you know, put all this information on one page and get that out to the public. Sure, we could get like an informational, yeah, sheet that kind of explained what all this entailed and then what what the change would mean. Is that kind of what you're asking about? Like, you know, here's what it's going to cost. Here's what it would happen. You know, who's going to, I mean, I think it's a, a, a fair point to identify that these people will be um, appointed by the governor for a year. Maximum two years. In this case, the appointment will last until the next general election. General election. And then. Each would be elected to a four-year term commensurate with uh, Commissioner Sellers' district. That's a four-year term, so that you always have a simple majority um, in one election, and or no more than a simple majority. So you would not, as you pointed out, would not want to have uh, four commissioners uh, for the same term. Did, did we ever check? The, the county has never tried this before. I know of it's, it's never been, <laughs> been to an election. The county uh, considered it in 2015 by the appointment of a committee, and I think maybe you've seen some of the results of that. Uh, but the county commission at that time decided not to take it forward. maps do we have right now? I think there may be at least 10 different versions. There, there are a lot that that York MIT has developed. I'm wondering if just an exercise in keeping this moving would be if all three commissioners pick their, for lack of better terms, three favorite maps could narrow it down at least maybe a little bit if none of us or if a majority of us aren't interested in certain maps maybe we could reduce that scope a little bit so the public can start seeing where our intent is on on the districting if if that were to occur do you want to do that like that idea do you guys want to come in to it and to the courthouse separate from a meeting or do you want us to bring at the next week bring all the maps over here. Well, if I, if I was, if they're digitally sent, like I could tell you my top yeah. three electronically, and then I could be ready next week. But that's just me. How does that work out, Commissioner Sellers? Think of that's that. That's very acceptable. Uh, I think uh, the the map uh, of the choice is very very important, and hopefully it's something that all three of us can agree towards a uh, end goal, and then. Uh, I think Daniel's uh, suggestion of moving on that quickly uh, gets a big issue out of the way of the discussion. So if we, if we could do that on the 29th, uh, we'd make uh, great strides, and then yet we would still have uh, uh, possibly three other meetings beyond that date before the August 10th. And if we had a draft of, like, the information sheet, possible next week and then if we get closer to some maps at least then we can have a, a good public information sheet that would have a, a month's worth of review time from the public. Okay, I'll work on that. I'm, 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 I'm still weighing, like just so you guys know where I'm at, I'm still weighing um, both sides. I'm not necessarily leaning heavily. Um, um, generally, like I said last time, I, I think there's a lot of merits associated with going to a five commission, um, five seat commission. I think um, uh, it just doesn't seem to be, even though, you know, I got a note from a, a citizen of Reno County that Generally, 
doesn't seem like there's a lot of people interested in this. And so I'm hoping that we'll get a little more engagement with some of the information we send out to, to help with it. But I agree with Commissioner Sellers, too. You know, if we think it's the right thing to do, even if nobody's that interested in it, I mean, that's, that's why they put us in charge, to be interested in it. So... You know, let, let me expand on what you just said. Is that you know we don't see the general public interested in many issues that we discuss. Uh, nobody contacted us on the uh, the uh, cat motor grader that we discussed today. Nobody contacted us on any of the expenses that we made. They've uh, put their trust in us to make uh, quality decisions for the future of the county. And uh, I think that's the reason why I feel like, uh, personally, uh, I, I support this and want to really look at it and go one way or the other before uh, the August 10th deadline. The, uh, to me, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And I think that going to a five-member public commission helps the style of government that we have now that we have a county administrator which everybody knows by my comments I think he should be called a county manager we are putting more and more of the work of the county into the administrator manager position and that's where it should be because these people are trained in managing a large business we aren't particularly trained in that. And so the commission should listen to the administrator slash manager and uh, make decisions for goals for the county and directions for the county and let the uh, administrator run the, the county business. And I think that would be better served by a broader commission. So I'm all for looking at maps uh, next Tuesday. further discussion. Seems like we're making good progress. Appreciate the staff support with us. So uh, we don't have any more discussion with regard to the five member uh, potential board of county commissioners. Let's go to county administrators. wanted to remind you and the public that July 6th and 7th is the budget work sessions. So on July 6th, Tuesday the 6th, we begin at 8.30 a.m. And right now the schedule has us going to probably about 2 p.m. with about an hour, hour and a half break for lunch. We don't have all of the fire districts scheduled. Um, I'm not sure if all of those districts will be able to make it, but we do have some of them. July 7th, we will begin at 9 a.m and probably around 2.30 p.m. And again, we'll have at least an hour break for lunch. <coughs> After those budget work sessions, I'll be asking for even more direction or once, you know, depending on how those days go, the next meeting on July 13th, the commission meeting, we will need, there'll be a needed decision on what the maximum mill levy rate is going to be in the county with the new with Senate Bill 13 that established the notification by July 20th, 20th we have to notify the county clerk of any intent to exceed the revenue neutral rate with the proposed tax rate and then have, this, have the hearing set so that's why I'm thinking on the July 13th we'll need to do that unless a special meeting is called between the 13th and 20th if, if the county does not get that completed in time after July 20th, we have not notified the county clerk. It's my interpretation of the Senate bill, then we would be stuck with the revenue neutral rate. And by doing that, more cuts would be needed in the budget to go even below what the revenue neutral rate is because as tax valuations still change between what the clerk sent, sent on June 15th and what will be certified in October. So, 
just kind of giving you an update on that. And then I attended the Civic Engagement ARP Funds meeting that the local group had last week. They're still working on discussion of setup of the 60 focus group meetings. And middle of July, we should get the final guidelines from the Treasury Department about the use of these funds. Just give it a quick update. Any questions? On the, um, on your, your point about cuts associated with additional bill levy reduction, um, how have we, or, or have you yet incorporated in your estimate seem like our sales tax revenues are up significantly. Maybe that's not a large part of the total budget. And then it seems like we have, we're not at full staffing capacity. Is that impact in the budget? The staffing does not. Could we budget for full staff? And if we're not fully staffed, that helps with the cash balance that we talked about in the last meeting. The sales tax um, rates going up. Yes, in the budget estimates for the, when we looked at revenue, when those numbers are entered, we did increase the sales tax expected amounts for 22. Does that push the bill levy down? Yes, it does. And or I just want to remind you of, of my request, if you can accommodate it related to cash balance goals, are you going to be able to do that in our meeting? Yes, I, I will, at least for the general fund. Some of the other funds are, with cash balance are a little trickier because they still could depend. The general fund could always help any other funds if needed, but I will have the recommendations, goals for the cash balance for the general fund at that meeting. How about the, uh, the uh, uh, solid waste? get a specific number on what the, the cash reserve requirements are? I, I believe the auditors have been working on that. I'll see if we have that number by July 6th. Any other questions? Mr. Sellers? No. Thank you, Randy. time of the year with the new state regulations and so forth, the state statutes, so. Got a commission report? Commissioner Freeze? Um, just a couple things. Um, keep getting asked about the bridge at 43rd. I forgot to email Don. Um, but, and I've seen it myself. The elevation difference, I don't know if you've seen it, is, oh, yeah. is weird. It's about, when you walk up to the bridge right now, it's, it's almost like five foot higher than the road. And there's a lot of people curious as to how Don's going to make that happen. Let me that for you. Okay. The, uh, the length of the bridge had to be expanded to cover the railroad's right-of-way, potential right-of-way, and that meant it higher. And as I recall, it was designed to be what when the bridge got to the, uh, let's say, almost the middle of the intersection between o uh, K61 and 43rd Street, it was going to be five, eight feet higher. And therefore, the road has to be extended at least 300 feet, is it, Ron? It, no, it's a little more than that, I think, but it's at least that. 300 feet to the west so that that is tapered off. And it would also require uh, modify OK61 so that it uh, tapers off from there, too. That was part of the additional expense of this bridge. So they're going to build a 43rd going west and yes. then old 61 going north and south. At least, at least uh, north, because that's our road. South is not our road. So I, Don can probably tell you what, what's going to happen there. 
We only took title to OK61 from the south right of way line of 43rd Street to Medora. All of the work that we're doing, I think, continues to remind me why we need to work on better state policy related to who's going to pay for what when it comes to railroad right of way. If you look at that, there's some pretty good pictures in the Hutch News, and um, it just seems unlikely that they're going to put another track in that part of Right of way, but um, I don't. It's you know, I mean, being being a, in the utility providing business, um, utilities never get that option to require you know the um, the, the government or the, the the people that own the bridge require them to um, go to great lengths to accommodate a, a private entities specific needs and so I, I continue to be disappointed that we have to spend taxpayer money to accommodate a, a, a for-profit entity um, so that's good information I think there was also another kind of uh, topic of question I think I can answer this one though there, there's purple street lights around town and uh, from what I read, um, there's a component failure in the street lights that West Westar Evergy is trying to resolve. Um, I think when you uh, you know remove one of the colors of a three color lamp, it creates purple. <laughs> so I think it's green that's missing out of that color spectrum. But um, uh, also. Um, I know we're kind of working towards um, some utility rate discussion for the, our two sewer districts. And, and Randy, I mentioned this to you, and I might mention it to the commissioners. Um, regardless of where we think the ultimate um, sewer rate is going to be, I think it might be time to just increase the rates to a, a reasonable rate immediately. What's their current rate for paying? It's, I think it's around four to six dollars a month. Maybe the residential versus commercial. So that's not really even like uh, nobody would expect to pay four dollars for sewer service. And so you know, if we raised it to a nominal fee of twenty to twenty-five, um, just to get things going, um, I'd like to see that done just to. Um, start some catch-up work immediately. I think it's so, and I agree with you, that they need to be raised. They should have been raised a long time ago. But I think we're really close within, what, 30 days or so of being able to come up with some figures on this. We're hoping, yeah, to be closer to on the whole project. I don't know. That, to me, I I don't know whether that uh, thirty or sixty days is or ninety days or whatever, hundred and twenty is going to make that much difference. I understand where you're coming from, commissioner. Well, but uh, but it would be nice to be able to say, okay, this is what it's going to be. When when is the the date in which we would feasibly have a rate? Establish. Well, we have to go through the financing first once we get the applications and the uh, grants and loans to see what, what the districts qualify for. Um, Is it a year? I, I think we'll know a lot sooner depending on what grants we get and the total amount of loan or bond that we're going to need if out of the $3 million project, we need to finance a debt $2 million, we would at least be able to then have an estimate of what the amortization of payments, what it would take for per user. But those won't be set in stone until probably yeah, end of the year. 
for next year? Six months. We would have a rate structure to establish in six months. Maybe not officially, but we'll know what we need to finance it. We'll need to know what we need. But I think it will take a resolution. We'll have to come back with the resolution with the rate structure based on, I think, the resolutions in existence now. I have to look at those also before recommending a rate increase because it limits the amount of savings and reserve that we can put into those sewer districts. If you come back next or, or in the next few weeks and, and your report provide a better estimate of when you think we can raise the rates based on estimates, please. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Sellers? I have nothing uh, other than I, I think I somewhat agree with Commissioner Friesen on this interim rate structure. Uh, uh, for some reason, I don't think that we'll have that project moving in a year. And uh, uh, we're ridiculously low. Uh, you know, we talk about the public being interested in things until those people in those districts realize that they're going to have significantly higher rates. We're not going to get any input from them. So I, I think the uh, potential rate increase at this time could uh, uh, force uh, uh, serious understanding of the users. Else? Yes, sir. You know, I, I, I would uh, pretty much agree with that with that statement and Commissioner Friesen. Uh, I think that could be coincided with a meeting at the at the area when we have a town hall meeting down there. That maybe that would be the good time to, to talk about and inform people this is the way it's going. And, we can start with a rate increase. That would be my thought. Uh, I don't have anything else except I've been remiss for a month. And I'm just congratulating all the seniors who graduated and, and wish them the best of luck in, in whether they go to a university or whether they go to a tech school or whether they go into the workforce. And uh, just congratulate them on, on uh, what they've done so far. Anything else?